Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you could join us for this webinar today that is co-hosted by both Florida Atlantic University's Office of Appreciative Education and the David Cooper Writer Center for Appreciative Inquiry at Champlain College. We are very excited to hear from our three panelists today, Dr. Jenny Bloom, Dr. Lindsay Godwin, and Dr. Joanna Rivera. Joanna joins us from Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, a part of the CUNY system. And the topic of today's webinar is the Higher Ed Positive Pivot, Voices from the Field on How Educators Are Innovatively Supporting Students in Today's World. With that, turn it over to Jenny. Thank you so much, Amanda and Brian, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Bloom. I am a professor in the Higher Education Leadership Program here at Florida Atlantic University. And I'm also the founder of the Office of Appreciative Education. And I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay Godwin to have her introduce herself, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Jenny. It is such a joy to be here with you and um, everybody that is joining us. So uh, my name is Lindsay Godwin and I am actually a professor of management in the Stiller School of Business at Champlain College in beautiful Burlington, Vermont. Um, and I have um, been had the good fortune of leading and doing appreciative inquiry work around the world for nearly 20 years. Um, since I was a doctoral student way back in the day with our uh, friend David Cooperwriter, the one of the founding thought leaders in appreciative inquiry. And there at Champlain College, I'm the academic director also of the Cooperwriter Center for Appreciative Inquiry, as Amanda was saying, is co-hosting this webinar. Um, and uh, our work at the Cooperwriter Center is basically um, we are a global hub for the Appreciative Inquiry global community. So helping to um, support people in learning about appreciative inquiry, applying appreciative inquiry, and amplifying appreciative inquiry um, around the world. So, and that very much includes uh, trying to lift up and put a spotlight on the amazing work that uh, Jenny and Amanda and others are doing uh, in the appreciative advising and appreciative education sphere. So um, I so look forward to being with you all today and um, sharing some stories and insights from our work. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy you can join us. My name is Joanna Rivera. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment Management at Kingsborough Community College. And my first experience uh, appreciative was back in 2015 when we launched it um, across the Hostos Community College um, campus and got everyone involved from advisors to faculty to the entire administration. So I'm thrilled to be here with Jenny and Lindsay and the rest of you. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Joanna. Um, so what we're, we're a big believer in active learning and getting you talking to each other. We, we realize that there is great wisdom in the room right now with us. So before we share any content, we want to give you an opportunity to learn from each other and share some of your stories. So Brian in a moment is going to be opening up some breakout rooms and here's what I'd like you to do. He's also um, has just put in a, a Google doc uh, link. So if you could click on that before you go into your breakout room, the question that we'd like for you to ask each other in that breakout room is what is a positive pivot that you've made during the pandemic that you intend to continue doing even after the pandemic has ended? So uh, if you could, when you go into your breakout rooms, take a moment to introduce yourselves. And we're gonna give you about five or six minutes in those breakout rooms. So you're gonna need to you know, share your story. You'll each have about a minute or so to share your story. And then we'll give you the one minute warning when we're going to teleport you back here into the main room. So. With that, Brian, can you please open up the breakout rooms and we will have you all get an opportunity to, to meet some of the other people in the room. So I was looking at what you all were posting in uh, on the Google Doc and it looked like a combination of how you're leveraging technology in creative ways, but also how you're taking time 
to take good care of you, which we've also done a webinar on about the importance of keeping your own cup full. So there are, you know, opportunities in obstacles. And so what I'm going to do next is I want to show you just this is about a five minute clip from a, a gentleman named DeWitt Jones, who was a photographer for National Geographic. And this is part of a TEDx talk that uh, I think is very applicable in our world today. I just decided that if I had a choice between a world based on scarcity and fear and one based on possibility, then man, I was choosing possibility. And no matter how dry and desolate, no matter how bleak and devoid of possibilities a situation might seem, that if I could just celebrate the best in it, in this case, just by dropping down into that slot canyon and looking back the other way, I could find a perspective that would transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. Through that, that lens of celebration, I could see one of nature's most important lessons. There's more than one right answer. There's more than one right answer. There are a thousand ways to come at any challenge to find that extraordinary view. And I know it so easily from my time at the Geographic. They sent me up to the town of Smith River in Northern California. They raise about 80% of the Easter lilies in the country around that village. That's the story I had to tell. And I've got a perspective where I got picked lilies and unpicked lilies and the boy picking them. One right answer. Pretty good one. But as a photographer, I never think of stopping there. I took this picture, immediately I grabbed another lens, walked over a couple rows, knelt down and found another right answer. Sir. Same parameters of the problem now seen from a totally different point of view. And my favorite right answer that day was this one. This is an advanced levitation technique that I picked up <laughs> along the way. So. <laughs> Three right answers. So many things begin to change when you come at the world from that perspective of more than one right answer. I mean, first of all, you never look for just one right answer. There's always more. But then as you begin to find more and more of them, you just get more and more comfortable with reframing obstacles into opportunities. Geographic sent me to the Selkirk Mountains of British Columbia. Gorgeous area. I'm wandering around. I find a field of dandelions. I should have been ecstatic, but I wasn't. I, I don't know why. Instead of my grabbing my cameras and running into it, I, I took a snapshot. I said, I don't know, the light's not quite right. I'll come back tomorrow. I didn't engage. We all know what happens when you don't engage. Tomorrow turns into the next day. The next day turns into the next week. And by the time I got back to that field, no more dandelions. <laughs> I had puffballs. <laughs> I wanted dandelions. I had puffballs. And I'm just about to leave when this little voice in my head says, do it. What's here to celebrate? What's right with this situation? You wanted dandelions. You got puffballs. 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 Pretty soon I'm down on the ground with the puffballs. I'm rolling around with the puffballs. I'm on top of the puffballs. I'm underneath the puffballs. And all of a sudden, whoa. Whoa. That extraordinary view. It always seemed to be there when I could look through that lens of celebration. Extraordinary image. But I can, I can already hear the cynics grumbling. Do it, you are such a Pollyanna. <laughs> you know, the world is in flames. War, terrorism, poverty, global warming, and you're shooting puffballs? <laughs> well, to the cynics, I say, change your lens. Celebrating what's right is not a perspective that denies the very real pain and suffering that exists on this planet. Rather, it's a perspective that puts those problems into a larger, more balanced context. A context when we can see that there's far more right with the world 
then there is wrong with it. So um, I know some of you may have heard DeWitt's and his um, full message before, but I see in the text chat coming that yes, DeWitt Jones's message today is, is very timely and very inspirational. And um, at its heart, um, as Jenny and I were, were talking with Joanna, um, as we were preparing this, we realized that DeWitt's message really is a beautiful summary for what appreciative inquiry really is. We know a lot of you on here, we have a variety of people that have been applying appreciative inquiry, whether you're coming from the uh, appreciative advising work uh, and community that you're doing. Some of you on here are just from the broader appreciative inquiry community. And some of you may be brand new to all of this and are just curious about um, this, this idea of how do we positively pivot in higher education. And we wanted to take just a minute and briefly um, share this, this idea about what is appreciative inquiry that again so echoes in DeWitt's message, but simply put, it is the search for what is life giving and possible within people in the world around us, just as DeWitt said, sort of this idea of reframing and looking at what is possible, um, recognizing that there isn't one right answer, um, but this idea from appreciative inquiry, just as DeWitt was saying, it's about how do we intentionally ask what we want to accelerate or grow? What do we want more of, right? With this realization that what we appreciate, appreciates in value. Just as he was saying he can do through his camera lens, right? Looking at the world um, through a different lens uh, is exactly what appreciative inquiry invites us to do. To see those possibilities in the puff balls <laughs> um, um, while we are also not denying um, all the things around us. So. Um, with that, those two words are very meaningful and very intentional. Um, again, this work of appreciative inquiry goes back um, nearly over 30 years of work um, grounded in uh, David Cooperwriter and Suresh Shravastava and others um, looking at these two very meaningful to verbs that they are, right? This act of appreciating and inquiring. And so those words are very intentional and very um, specific. And so let's take each one of those just briefly for a minute. And then we're gonna dive into some, some stories and examples of how we have been taking an appreciative approach to our work um, in higher ed. So that first one, and Jenny, I think you can go forward there. Um, this idea of that word appreciate, as I said, right? This idea that what we focus on appreciates. The word appreciate is an economic term. Right, so I, I love it that David and others didn't, didn't intentionally use the word positive inquiry, they used the word appreciative inquiry for this special meaning of the word appreciative, right? It's an economic term. It means what we focus on appreciates or grows in value. Again, just as DeWitt was inviting us to do um, in the story in the video that we just watched of looking at what is there to be valued and appreciated here in this moment, in this person, in this student, in this colleague, in this, in this community. Right? With the idea again that what we focus on and paying attention to that all of a sudden appreciates in value, just as he saw with those puffballs. And that other verb, right? So from appreciative, right? So thinking about this economic sense to inquire. The idea and in appreciative inquiry, again, which is really at the heart of our work with uh, appreciative advising is it really does, these questions that we ask are so important. So much so that we talk about our questions being fateful because our questions focus our attention and cause us to pay attention to certain things and not others, right? We're paying attention to the dandelions or the puffballs, right? We're paying attention um, to what is bef before us. So again, thinking about the questions that you ask, whether that is one-on-one -on -one with a student, with a colleague, or, um, and I've done appreciative inquiry work literally around the world from the United Nations to Nepal, but some of the most impactful appreciative inquiry work that I've done, it's been around my kitchen and dining room table with my own children and asking questions just like this. So these are just some great, um, again, uh, tools and classic appreciative questions that you can put in your toolbox um, I come from our work with uh, Jackie Kelm summarizes these in her work with appreciative engagement, but again, asking questions about what we want more of, right, not less of. Those questions about what do we want to start doing, not necessarily stop doing, right? What do we want to create, not remove, to support, not prevent, and to reinforce, not weaken. Again, we're so used to asking those 
those diagnostic or deficit questions. Um, and really, again, appreciative inquiry and our work in appreciative advising and in appreciative education invites us to remember the importance of our questions and to ask these questions about the things we want to appreciate or grow in value. So again, we invite you to take those, um, those classic questions and start playing with them today in new ways, paying attention to the questions that you ask others and of the questions people ask you and thinking about how you can be uh, an influencer um, in, in your conversations by asking these different appreciative questions. Thank you, Lindsay. And now I want to transition to talk about uh, further about this, this power of questions. And as we've embarked upon this great adventure <laughs> during the pandemic, uh, I thought it might be helpful to go back to a, a a clip from a webinar that Michael Bjorkia at Utah State University did for us a, a little bit earlier in, in the pandemic. And I'm gonna just play this because it, it reminds us that the questions that we're asking really are fateful. The theme, the punchline for today is people before process. This is a theme that Donna taught me as soon as we moved into the pandemic I love checklists. How are we going to support students? What does it look like to work from home? Does my team have the skills they need to utilize the internet? Does anyone have internet at their homes? Do we have laptops? I immediately went into checklist mode and it really wasn't what anyone needed. It really wasn't what I needed to be in checklist mode and it wasn't what the folks on my team needed. We actually needed to be in people mode. And as I was, I talked to Donna early on and I needed her advice about prioritizing. I was feeling overwhelmed as a leader. I was, I had to work with a heat pack on my neck. I needed like just feeling stressed and you feel weighed down. And it was a great indicator to me that something wasn't working. I was working around the clock. I was exhausted. Then it was time to work in the next morning. I was foggy. My thoughts were unclear. Um, I really wasn't working at my best. And I went to Donna really for strategic advice. Donna, can you help me prioritize? This is my checklist of things to do, but what are you thinking about and what are the most important things to you? And she kind of smiled at me in a really nice way. And she said, people before process. And I, it shocked me. Um, I realized that my checklist was incredibly important. It really was important. Do people have the internet? Do they have a laptop? Can people work from home? What are the frameworks? for remote work? How are we going to support students? The checklist, the checklist is really important. But the thing that's even more important than the checklist is the people. And when I reframed my checklist, when I thought about people, the rocks almost came out of my backpack. Um, that feeling and that heavy weight of just, I felt like I was, I, a lot of the people that I've talked to, we almost all feel like we're carrying the entire institution. <laughs> We just feel like we're, we're carrying our offices, we're trying to carry our colleagues, we're trying to carry our students. And when we do that alone, it feels really heavy. And when we put people before process, we actually share the responsibility for all of our success, for the success of our students, for the success of our office, for the success of our institution. And when we put people before process, it actually makes our checklist items, it prioritizes itself. Uh, the people come first, and then the checklist items and how we're going to accomplish that becomes more clear. So I think that's a great segue. So right before the governor put New York on pause, um, the president brought us all together and started the conversation about how are we going to connect our new students from the campus to a campus they've never been to. And so our mantra became, how do you bring Mohammed to the, if you can't bring Mohammed to the mountain, how do we bring the mountain to Mohammed? And so in the spirit of the publisher's clearing house, we sat around the table and we came up with the president's welcome wagon. So between the months of June to September, the president visited 
new students being admitted to the college at their homes and gave them what we tagged swag bags. They had cups, they had t-shirts, they had every little tchotchke they would have possibly gotten during either orientation or welcome week. So we're just gonna play the first video that we taped of the first students that she visited on her welcome wagon. Go ahead, Jenny. It's not Friday, it's Fly Day, because we're giving away swag bags to three incoming KCC students. The welcome wagon is on its way. And on her visits, just to finish off that video, on her visits, she not only took political leaders with her, she took our vice chancellor, or the chancellor of the university system with her on several visits. So it was just a wonderful new, fresh of breath air um, to bring to our students and connect them to the campus. And she's continuing to do that as the spring semester for new students approaches. So what we learned building the communication ladder. So, it felt like we were trying to climb a ladder and build it at the same time. Very soon after we went on pause, we tried to think about how are we going to have faculty and students and staff in the community reach out to us, right? We had not been on remote work at this magnitude ever. And so we started by the first process we, is we started forwarding our office extensions to our cell phones. Well, we very quickly learned that students would love to call us at three o'clock in the morning to get a question answered. And so that didn't last very long. And we learned about acquiring Google numbers to mask our cell phones so that we can take calls during appropriate times to not, and get actually get some rest during the day while we're trying to do everything else. Later, we found out from our IT department that there's a system called soft phones where we can mask our cell phones to appear as if we're calling students directly from the campus. Many times students weren't picking up the calls because they were seeing a very strange number they've never seen before. So being able to mask those phone numbers as our campus number allowed us to be able to communicate with the students and get feedback very quickly. Later, we progressed to our chat feature, which many of you are aware of. If you call a bank or you call a place of business, you have a chat feature on the right-hand corner where you can click on that and get somebody to respond to an inquiry rather quickly. And now we are at the point where the university has acquired Zoom licenses for all of the staff and faculty at the campus. And so we created virtual front desk. If you're not familiar with the virtual front desk, a student clicks on a Zoom link, there is someone there to greet them immediately. We have breakout rooms where we have specialists who can take care of whatever issue the student needs to take care of. And we quickly check them in, take their information and move them over to a breakout room so that they can have their questions answered or process taken care of. Next slide. Okay, admissions, welcome week, orientation and registration. We had to rethink all of that from scratch. We started with virtual tours, trying to take pictures of the campus so that people can, and prospective students can see what the campus looked like. Rather than doing general open houses, although we do have general open houses, we strategized on having major specific open houses with chairs and faculty who can give very targeted information to students who are interested in those programs. We held very large Zoom sessions with breakout rooms, with consultants, with subject matter experts. We have our student life department conducting activities for students on a weekly basis in these very large sessions where we can do different activities via separate breakout rooms. Registration was our biggest challenge. How are we gonna bring in a brand new class of hundreds of thousands of students without them ever coming onto campus? And so we it, 
we had a conversation earlier today when we were talking about it takes a village and it certainly does take a village. We created a large Zoom account with about 75 staff members that had 50 different breakout rooms for advisors, registrar experts, financial aid experts, individuals ready to give permission for students who had any kind of trouble with their registration. To the student, it was an absolute seamless process. They clicked on a Zoom link, they got put into a main room and immediately went to see an advisor who can advise them in their major or to take care of an issue prior to going to advisement. It was a huge undertaking, but again, I, I'm constantly surprised at the ingenuity of our staff and our faculty. Next slide. And finally, telehealth visits. We found out very early on that our students, our staff, and our faculty were struggling. They were undergoing stress, the uncertainty of what was happening. There were social and racial injustices. A lot of us didn't know how to handle all of this. Coupled with the fear of the unknown about the pandemic, we didn't know if we were gonna be gone for a week, a month, or a year. And navigating several online platforms for not only online teaching for our faculty, but online learning for our students. And so we partnered very quickly with our mental health and counseling department to do telehealth visits, one-on-one -on -one visits where you can be in a safe space and just talk out the anxiety or stress that you're having. It was, we did not get a lot of traffic when we started it, but now I can tell you that we get over 85 requests a week for individuals wanting to talk to us and just talk out what does the future look like and how can we help them navigate what's to come. I'm going to turn it over now to Lindsay. Thank you. Um, yeah, building on that, um, the I love the the stories are sort of like at the system level, right? All of the amazing things that you all did to pivot to support students. Um, and they're going forward, Jenny, on the next slide is sort of this guiding question that I've heard in your work, uh, Jana, and, and it's really the guiding question that for me as, a, as an educator in the classroom with my students has been my guiding appreciative question of what's in the best interest of our students, right? As I know, as educators, we hold this question in our hearts um, so, so much, but even more so, especially, Jana, as you're talking about now, like sort of the stress, the, 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 um, just the the all of the things that that our students are juggling and holding right now of sort of not knowing what is happening in their world um whether that's in their classroom sort of financially everything else this question has been my guiding uh, appreciative question um as i sort of want to share just a brief story sort of now looking at in the classroom some of the things that i've done to pivot again sort of building and echoing john what you were talking about sort of at that system level and then down now into my classroom so um, again, I teach a variety, I teach undergrads, I teach our graduate students, but, um, and I've seen, you know, in our, at, at Champlain College, we have um, traditional four-year, um, uh, you know, students uh, that have been primarily on campus, and now we've, we've switched to this being a flex hybrid, so with classes both sort of some in person, some online, some mixed, um, and it is, it is a challenge, right? It's a challenge for us as educators to be designing and juggling this. It is a challenge for our students um, to be juggling this. And so as I, as like many of you maybe have seen, right, as, as you were saying, John, is that we've seen students who are struggling uh, increasingly so, right? So mental well-being, health issues, um, and just sort of the stress of, of doing all of this. And so, um, uh, and I've increasingly seen, um, you know, students who are having um, challenges with turning things in on time, <laughs> um, getting getting all of their deliverables in. And in fact, um, we've had a longstanding uh, policy in our program that late work, for example, is not accepted, right? Trying to pre prepare people to be, um, you know, professionals and sort of get them ready for the workplace. And so we've long had a policy and I've had a policy of not accepting late work. Um, and I will admit that I've, I've been rethinking that policy, obviously, like in the current times that we've had. And so, for example, I recently had a student who um, has been um, struggling to turn things in on time. I've, I've reached out to him several times. Again, I 
I in the past would reach out to students that I'm concerned about, but in this sort of guiding question what's in the best interest of my students I didn't just do a one and done reach out so part of my pivoting has been ongoing checking in with students so continual reaching out, even when I don't hear back from them right I used to sort of be like well I've reached out I've done, you know I let them know that I'm here and they will reach out and so one of the things that I've been pivoting to do is to do sort of the continual. Um, sort of check in like I haven't heard from you I'm concerned about you let's meet let's talk how can we sort of get a plan in place to get you um, to be successful in our class and so I'm so grateful that I um, continued to do this uh, proactive reach out with my students this semester because I am seeing it pay off um, in terms of you know it might take um, where one email in the past would get somebody's attention um, you know, three or four emails in now. I've, I had a student just this past week. Um, he had been um, not turning in things. He had been coming off and on to our virtual class. Um, and I, I finally, when he responded to me, again, my first um, response to him, and again, very intentional from this, again, what do I want more of, is I thanked him very intentionally, very um, in my response to him, thank you for responding to me, thank you, I'm so grateful to hear from you, um, to sort of reinforce, right, we're trying to appreciate what we want more of, I'm trying to appreciate the fact that he responded and reached out to me. So very intentionally starting my communications with him with gratitude and appreciation for him and his response to me. Again, might not have been what I would have done <laughs> in, um, and, and under different circumstances, but my after sort of moving from a place of of um, showing him intentional appreciation for just the act of responding to me. Um, I didn't dive right into the, the content of, okay, like, well, how are we gonna talk about this? I really started from, again, what's in the best interest of our students? The best interest in this student right now is how is he doing, right? How is he doing in this moment of, in time and space? And then we'll get to my class, right? We'll get to the class conversation. And so we, um, ended up having a, a, a Zoom conversation with him and really having this conversation about how he's doing and learning that he is, um, you know, he'd been struggling with, with mental, um, his own sort of mental health. Um, he had been, um, you know, had actually ended up going to uh, see our, our counseling services and getting some, some other support, but really talking with him about, you know, what is the support he's getting? What are other supports that I can offer to him? So to your point, John, so making him aware of other resources on campus um, and beyond campus that uh, could support him. And then it was only then after sort of letting him sort of share and talk about this, then let's talk about, okay, how are we going to get a plan in place for you to, to be successful and to catch up in class? Again, part of my pivot was in the past, if there was stuff that was missing, that would be, that was sort of, that was it, right? And so the, the, the stance that I'm, I'm starting to take, not just with this students, but with other students who have had similar, um, have had a similar experiences with as they're struggling to juggle, what does five online classes look like while they're trying to work to pay for campus life and, and, and living and, and tuition while they're also worried about their own family and stuff, right? And their finances that are going on. So, um, I really have, uh, then we moved to sort of talking about, okay, let's get a plan in place. What is success? Again, what's the question that I want them? What is, what is it gonna look like? How can we get a plan in place for you to, to successfully finish this course, right? Putting that intentional um, image in their head that they are gonna successfully finish my course. And let's talk about what that is um, in terms of getting them, again, just like any good sort of them project management, let's look at what's missing. Let's look at what do we need what are the resources they need to sort of finish and be successful again and then and Jenny and, and Jenna we've talked about this too though the balance of what's in the best interest of our students the best interests of the students are the student that's right in front of me and it's all of my other students too right so really working to um to ensure that I'm also honoring those that are turning things in on time and recognizing all that so even while I'm making plans uh one-on-one -on -one and individually now with students to get them on a success path um, to to complete the, the courses as they need to. Um, it's also it's not that they're 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 going to be necessarily getting like full credit for something that they turn in late, right? So sort of also recognizing and and balancing that that life lesson of um, again uh, trying to honor those that 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 are doing the work, but also trying to have that um, the grace and the um, sort of the the 
the, um, the support for those that need it too. So getting those plans in place, recognizing that they will get some um, partial credit, but that partial credit really moves them into being able to successfully finish the course. Um, and then my, it's not a one and none of these are one and done conversations. Again, one of my pivots is then being more intentional with follow-up. What's in the best interest of my students is for them to feel that they are completely seen and valued <laughs> for the work that they're putting into. So it's not a one and done conversation that I literally put on my calendar, like a reminder for myself to email them, to check in with them, right? To sort of follow up with them and to make sure that they are doing. And exactly as students say, sort of that, that and uh, again, balancing the accountability and flexibility is sort of that pivot that I'm still learning. I'm sure I could learn so much from those of you on this, this call, but sort of that is the, I think that's the invitation for us as educators right now is to hold in our heart this question of what's in the best interest of our students in this moment. And you know what, doing an essay for my class might not be the best interest of them. They need to actually be focused on, on their, <laughs> their own mental well-being right now. And then getting them to a place that then we can have this conversation about accountability while I'm also holding flexibility. So that's just a little micro example of a story of sort of how I'm translating that into the classroom. So Jenny, I know you have stories. Indeed. Thank you, Lindsay. I think your story of your work with that young man is an excellent example of putting people before process, right? That you had to meet him where he was at, deal with him as a real person before starting to talk about the process for getting caught back up with your assignments. And this reinvention uh, mindset is so important. I, I think, you know, this this pandemic, these multiple pandemics that we've been dealing with have been an opportunity for me to reinvent myself and some of my processes as an advisor. So I have 67 master's degree students in the higher education leadership program. And I met with each of them this fall. In fact, I did it between like August 31st and the end of September. And I realized that the process that I had used for advising when I was in person was going to have to change because frankly, I was killing a lot of trees. <laughs> I was giving students a lot of handouts and I wasn't going to be able to easily do that. I knew through our Zoom platform. So I ended up using uh, a website called Padlet to organize my materials. And Brian has just put into the chat the link to the Padlet that I put together. And it has everything from information about how to schedule your advisory conference to the courses that are being offered in the spring to our degree requirements in that first column course links to our program pages we our students have to fill out a plan of study so I ended up putting all of this information here and there's about I don't know about 15 different columns that include information on summer internships and higher ed professional associations and the APA and you know how to do do well in stats I just was able to kind of begin adding in additional information as I met with each student. And I did this for the students, but it ended up saving me so much time because I realized that when I was getting inquiries from students, I was going and kind of looking things up and then sending them the link. And now I just had one link to go to, and that made all the difference in terms of saving me time, but it also, save students time because they know that there's one place that they can go that should have the answer to lots and lots of their questions. The other thing that I did was that I took notes during the advisory conference and I usually physically did them and gave students a copy of it at the end. And instead what I did was I changed my advisory conference template to a fillable PDF. And I was able to show students on one of my screens what I was writing in. So it was a combination of the degree requirements document. And then at the bottom, I had my advisory conference notes that I was taking. So they could see in real time what I was writing. And we were able to make amendments, make sure that I was you know, hearing them correctly. And then at the end, I was able to send the PDF as a file to the student through Zoom 
through the chat. And that ended up saving me a lot of time. I didn't realize that when I first started that I could do that. And so I was having at the end of the day to write an email, say, you know, it was great meeting with you. And I've attached my, my notes, but this ended up saving me so much time uh, during the day when I was in back-to-back -back advisory conferences. So it allowed me by kind of consolidating all of these resources onto the Padlet and making my, uh, my notes a fillable PDF, it then maximized the amount of time then that I could spend talking to the student about how they were doing and what kinds of obstacles that they were undergoing and, and talk about the, the real world, which has had a, a huge impact on our students in particular this fall. And so uh, that, that reinvention, I had to figure out how can I turn this obstacle into an opportunity? And frankly, I think I'm going to end up continuing to use this Padlet, that's for sure, but I may end up using uh, Zoom as a platform even when we're back in uh, back on campus because many of my students work full time and it was, you know, it was a sacrifice for them to be able to make time to come in and see me. So, yeah, so that was my um, attempt at, at reinventing my process so that I could focus more on people. And then I just want to share a question that has been a really a guiding force for me throughout the pandemic. And it's by a woman named Cy Wakeman, who is an HR person. And this question, what would great look like right now has been important because we've all had good days and we've had bad days and we've had highs and we've had lows. And when I have been feeling not at my best, I find that when I ask myself this question, Jenny Bloom, if you were great right now, what would great look like? I know exactly what it would look like. And once I have that in my mind, then it's funny, I step up into that, but I have to take that moment of self-reflection. And that's why I feel like this question is such a powerful question that we can ask ourselves. So uh, I'm gonna end with a question is that, you know, imagine that we're writing the greatest success story in the history of humanity. What do you want your chapter to say? As we're, we're all gonna remember 2020, you know, as you get older, you realize over time, you just, the, the years start to blend together and you don't necessarily remember the differences between 2015 and 2016. We're all going to remember 2020. What do you want your chapter to say? You know, what do you? What are the positive pivots that you've made and that you're going to continue to make? That's going to allow you to continue to reinvent yourself and reinvent your process. So we want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. I want to invite you to. Uh, Go ahead and put questions in the chat. We'll also have opportunities for you to unmute yourself. But I want to give Lindsay an opportunity to just give a little sneak preview of some of the exciting events that the Cooper Writer Center has coming up. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and yes, those are just um, questions. Again, I hope all of us take to heart and continue on um, after this, this session together and invite you to ask those questions to others. And as Jenny said, so um, we'd love to share, you know, upcoming learning opportunities if you want to do some more deeper dives into appreciative inquiry specifically in different ways that you can apply it in addition to advising and all of the wonderful work that I know so many on this call are doing. Um, and again, we're trying to, to create more sort of diverse and, and global offerings around the world in appreciative inquiry. So for example, we have a, our introductory sort of appreciative mindset course coming up actually in Spanish. So um, our Mindset Appreciativo class um, is our four week um, uh, mindset course, sort of just diving into some of the principles and thinking about how do you apply appreciative, some of these perspectives to your own life and develop this appreciative mindset. Um, conversations worth having, we have several courses on that, sort of looking at how do you take appreciative inquiry and really bring it into practically into the conversations that you're having and reframing those questions and conversations as we've been talking about. 
Um, the idea of driving the narrative storytelling, right? How do we become sort of these, um, as a leader, it's a leadership competency to help create these visions for the future and invite people to sort of, you know, crafting these, the stories that we tell, as Jenny was saying, become, right? Become our, our images for the future, drive us forward. So looking at that, and then we have a full thing on our conversations, um, trainer certification. So that, and lots of others. And um, yep, thank you, Brian, put into the chat there, a link to our upcoming calendar of events if you wanna stay connected with this. And we either have free webinars and other opportunities too to connect um, with the global appreciative inquiry community. So we'd love to have you all continue to connect with us and each other. Thank you, Lindsay. They're doing really great work at Champlain College in the Cooper Writer Center. Uh, just wanted to, to mention our FAU Office of Appreciative Education website. This has information about all of our upcoming events. And I did want to mention that we are taking registrations for our spring 2021 uh, online appreciative advising course. And we will also be offering our online appreciative administration course. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian, who is going to uh, lead us in the Q&A session. So, Brian. Thank you so much, Jenny. And I haven't seen many questions pop through, but if you think of any questions, please pop it through on the chat. One question that we did receive, um, Joanna, you were talking about that phone software program, and I wanted to confirm that is soft phones where it links your phone number to the office. So when you call a student, that student sees the office number opposed to a random uh, personal cell phone number. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Awesome, and what has been your experience with that so far? The response rate from students has been phenomenal. Um, again, many of our calls prior to soft phones were going to voicemail, may or may not have been answered by students simply because they just did not recognize the number. Having the number come up as Kingsborough Community College is calling gets us to the student much quicker and gets them to respond to us much quicker. So it has been a life changer for us. Awesome, thank you. And then this next question is directed to all three of the panels panelists, but it will be focusing in on Padlet. So just as a general processing question, Padlet versus Trello versus Google Keep. What, have any of y'all experienced the different platforms and which one do you care for most? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I have used two of the three. I've used Padlet and I've used Trello. And what I really like about Padlet is that it has settings where it allows you to have people, uh, they can contribute like you all did on that gratitude wall. Brian, maybe you want to stick that back in the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the chat again. So you can set it up where people can, can add things. We have, I'm using this, you know, for the gratitude wall. I'm using this in my classes. We use this to organize all of our material, materials for the Appreciative Advising Institute. And we also had kind of kudos walls set up for each of our participants at the Institute. And so people can add in things and it's not just comments. They can add in uh, GIF files. They can add in uh, movies, they can add in web pages. And so it's just graphically more pleasing. Uh, and for example, some of my student, my PhD students are using it to organize their uh, chapter two, their literature review. So they're posting all of their articles under different categories on the Padlet. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Padlet. I have used Trello. In fact, we did the appreciative administration course. We we combined uh, forces with a lot of people. And so you're able to post things there too. So I, I think that works. And for me personally, for my own to-do list, I use uh, a, a website called Kanban Flow. It's K-A-N-B-A-N Flow, F-L-O-W. And I use that for my day-to-day to-do -day to list. I don't know if if Lindsay or Joanna have anything they want to add in? 
No, I was just going to add, Jenny, I love your, your, your stories. And I know there's so many on here too, of the, like, it goes back to like, what's this, what's best for the students and what's the student experience. So again, and it's not just about translating, like, this is what we did in person. And so this is what we're, it's like really looking at what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to accomplish here? And what's the right tool for that? And so whether that is, you know, we've played with jam boards, you know, there's all kinds of different, you know, whiteboard things and stuff. And so it really is, as, as, as I know educators on here know, it's, it's always less about the tool. And it's like, what is it that we're trying to do? And then what's the right, because there'll, no, there'll be a new tool tomorrow, right? And so it's that getting the clarity of what is the experience? What is it, again, what's in the best interest of supporting you know, interpersonally and the learning needs of my students. And Jane, I love your example of like how Padlet, you've been able to do that. And, um, and I'm sure that there's, there's lots of other, there's tools out there that, yeah, I've used different ones. And so, but it always comes back to what is the experience and what is it that I'm trying to accomplish um, and putting that people before process. Mm -hmm. Yes, point. it's that putting people before process. That's really important, especially right now when we are all going through such difficult and challenging times. I wanna be conscious of the time and that it is two o'clock Eastern time. So we are going to start to close this up, but I'm going to put the Office of Appreciative Education email in the chat. And if at any point you have questions, do not hesitate to email us. We will make this uh, session available on our website at www.fau.edu forward slash OAE. It will take about 48 hours to get that posted. But once it's posted, we will identify to all of y'all or to all of you that it has been posted. So again, I want to say thank you to our panelists. Y'all have been amazing. And then thank you to all of you who have joined us today, taking time out to really put that, stu that people before process and that student experience before the checklist. So thank you.